So, hi again, good morning. Uh, what I had thought I was going to do uh, is uh, to try to survey methods that have been used to uh, prove things. And this isn't definitive, it's just methods that I've used. And I actually hope that and as the conversation goes on, people can say, well, you forgot about so-and-so. How could you do that? And uh, so um, I, I'll tell you, soon you'll know what I'm actually going to do. But uh, uh, here are some methods of proof. Uh, oh, the first thing, I, I did take it out of the box. I thought it's a nice new marker. But uh, OK, uh, I'll try another one, first of all. That, is promising. Um, so methods of proof. Uh, and this is for rates of convergence for Markov chains to stationarity. Uh, a, a first one is you can sometimes explicitly diagonalize the operator. Uh, set diagonalization. And there are you know, lots of examples, maybe hundreds, uh, in which I know all the eigenvalues, I know, know all the eigenvectors, and I can just you know, blast it out. And a, a big special case of that is random walks on groups, where you get to use character theory or representation theory. And I'll do some of that in my last lecture. But there are many, many examples where you can blast it out. A second set of techniques, which Pietro talked about a little bit, are functional inequalities. And these are things like uh, uh, Poincare, Cheeger, Nash. Sobolev, log Sobolev, and there are there are some others, and so that's a world, uh, and um, and there are many many things to say about that that world, uh, but certainly a lot of progress has been made using using those ideas. A third set of techniques they are somehow different, uh, or I call them geometric. Uh, and, and I mean the, the kind of thing that Yuval was talking about, spectral embedding, uh, embedding, um, and there's a technique due to Martin Kasabov. And I'll talk about that, CASA above. Um, uh, I have to explain that. But somehow they're using the, the geometry of the problem. These are all kind of analytic. Uh, uh, a, a very different set of techniques are, are coupling techniques, and particular path coupling. And I, I hope Yuval and I will still be speaking uh, after I put down the next phrase, uh, curvature uh, estimates. Uh, um, Jan Ol Olivier uh, made his own version of, of, uh, of path coupling. And that's a, a rich set of techniques. But they're kind of mm, quite different flavor. Uh, uh, of these, uh, a, a fifth uh, or stopping time arguments. I'll, I'll say strong stationary times, but other stopping times too, a bit different than coupling. And 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 Perla Susie gave a very nice in introduction to those. Um, there's another set of techniques which I'll say our community doesn't use so much, but some communities use. Uh, and those are Harris recurrence. Uh, and, and a crude version, or a Dublin. Uh, 
and um, uh, Lyapunov type uh, functions. Um, anyway, bad, bad spelling. There's another set of techniques. Uh, this stops here, uh, uh, which I'll call backward iteration. And, and what else did I, well, contraction, the Brushian uniqueness, can't spell anything. Uh, okay, they all need to be explained. And then there's a final set of techniques, um, which I call the method of miracles. Okay, so uh, I had planned to, in, in two lectures, kind of give some sort of, it's an insane thing to do, by the way, but I had planned to try to tell you a few words uh, about each of those. But instead, uh, today at any rate, uh, and then we can discuss for tomorrow, I'll tell you what I'm planning to do, I'm going to talk about the method of miracles. So, uh, and then, okay, so, uh, and the method of miracles, at least it's simple to say, uh, especially here, you know, sometimes a miracle happens. Right? <laughs> um, and, and that you can uh, explicitly know everything about your chain. Uh, and uh, um, I'm going to do one set of examples. And this is a, a, itself a, a subject, and um, uh, which are, uh, uh, so uh, this, this version of it is uh, uh, random walks. on the chambers of hyperplane arrangement. And so let me, <laughs> what does that have to do with eight? Well, this, first of all, it, it, it most of the miracles occur here. This is a big class of Markov chains where you just know everything. And so now the task is to take some Markov chain you care about and see if you can fit it into this, um, into this context. Now, if you haven't seen this before, and probably most of you haven't, what I'm going to say for the next five minutes is you're just going to think I'm crazy, OK? But, well, we can discuss after, but it won't, you know, how could this have anything to do with anything? Okay, so please bear with me, and then I promise at the end you'll say, aha, okay, I hope. Um, so um, I, I'm going to work in, uh, uh, I'm going to work in uh, a Euclidean space uh, in, in, say, RD, and um, that's, that's where I start, and I start with, um, a, which is um, H1, H2, up to HK, say, um, uh, a collection of affine hyperplanes. So co-dimension one subspaces. So if D is two, um, you know, here, here they are. That's, you know, if D is 2, there's just a collection of lines, and, and if D is 3, well, they're, 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 there's, you know, planes, and they cut uh, space up into pieces. So a collection of affine hyperplanes uh, cut space into pieces. There are the chambers, the set of chambers uh, I'll call at C, and those are the points in Euclidean space which aren't on any of the hyperplanes. So that's a chamber, that's a chamber, that's a chamber. So there's the chambers, OK? And uh, I call that C. There's a finite collection of chambers. Um, and then there are the faces of the hyperplane arrangement. And that's script F. 
and um, those are points in space that are on, on some of the hyperplanes uh, and on one side or the other of others of them. So for example, this is a face. Um, this is a face, points are faces, okay? So they're points which are on certain hyperplanes and on one side or the other of, of, of others of them. Chambers are faces, points are faces, okay? So the, the, the chambers are included in the faces there, okay, just by, by convention. So a hyperplane arrangement has, you know, has uh, faces and chambers. And we're gonna make a random walk on the chambers uh, see, and uh, uh, in order to uh, describe it, I need to tell you one geometric idea, which is the projection of a of a chamber on a face. Uh, the uh, if F is a face and C is uh, a chamber, the projection of uh, of C on F. Uh, is, is, is the uh, closest, is the, uh, is the chamber C prime adjacent to F and, and closest to C, I'll explain, uh, C. So um, here, let me put another one in. Uh, so suppose that, um, you know, well, suppose that this is my, my face, F, and this is my, um, this is my hyperplane, this is my, sorry, chamber C. So I'm given a chamber and a face, and the projection will be, here it'll be this, uh, here this will be C prime. Um, uh, you take one of the chambers that, is, has F as a, as a subface that, whose closure contains F, and you pick the one which is closest, and closest in the sense of if you c have to cross hyperplanes, here I have to cross one, two, three to get here. If I want to get here, I have to go, well, one, two, three, four. Okay, so you might ask, is that well defined? And it is well defined, so that's a little lemma. It's an easy little lemma. It's a lemma due to Jacques Titz, and uh, that that there's a unique chamber adjacent to any face and its closest, and that's called the projection of the chamber onto the face. Okay, so it's just a definition uh, and a little lemma. Um, okay, I told you you think I was crazy, right? I mean, what does this have to do with probability? Well. The projection, the projection is, um, the projection of a chamber on a face is a chamber which is adjacent to the face and which is closest in the sense of crossing the fewest number of hyperplanes, and then it's a lemma that that's well defined. Okay. So now here comes some probability. Uh, uh, so uh, choose uh, uh, WF. Uh, F contained in F, uh, where WF is bigger than or equal to zero, and the sum of WF is one. So choose weights on the faces, any weights you like, anything. Now I can run a random walk, uh, uh, which goes this way, uh, from C, I'm at some chamber C, uh, pick F, from WF, pick a face from these weights, and go to uh, uh, C prime. Here is the projection of uh, C uh, on F. Okay, so the kernel, K, C, C prime, the chance of going to C prime from C is just the sum of WF so that uh, the, so that, uh, the projection of uh, C to uh, F is C prime, and you know, there, there might be, okay, so it's just, 
it's just, I'm just, you know, pick a face, project onto that face. Pick another face, project onto that face. And uh, these ingredients uh, uh, define, uh, that's, a, that's a Markov chain. And uh, so now I have to um, give you some examples so that you see that this is interesting. And I promise you it's interesting, but let me, okay, some examples. Uh, uh, let's say in, in two dimensions, uh, uh, say in R2, uh, the dihedral arrangement is just, uh, uh, it's a central arrangement. Uh, this, these, this should go through here. Uh, th this is, is, is n lines, n lines through zero. Okay, and um, uh, that's, not, that's not very well drawn, uh, but let me try a little bit better. Okay, and so this has, this one has six chambers. Uh, it has uh, the six chambers and six half lines as faces and this central point. Those are the faces, okay? Um, the, uh, um, let's suppose that I choose my face weights as W1, W2. I just choose these half lines, W3, W4. W5, W6, those are six numbers that add up to one. I, I, I just, I'll put, I'll put mass only on the half lines, okay? And, um, and then the walk uh, is the following. Um, I'll picture a circular house, and um, there's a, 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 a mouse that uh, lives in the walls, okay? And uh, there's a cat who lives in the room, and the mouse pops up. If the mouse pops up here and the cat is here, the cat moves you know, to the chamber adjacent to where the mouse popped up, okay? And then just the, the, then the mouse pops up over here and the cat moves to the, to the chamber that's closest to the cat. Another image for this is as a queuing system. Uh, you have one server. Uh, jobs come in with different, you know, different propensities, and the and the the server moves to the section of the room adjacent. So it's just an example to think about. That is a simple, interpretable, understandable Markov chain, and it's a it's a chain that, as you'll see, we just know absolutely everything about. But you know, even for that chain, if n is large, uh, you can ask what's the stationary distribution, what's the mixing time. How does the thing behave? A uh, real example, and, uh, but there are many, 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 is the braid arrangement. Again, in RD, say. Uh, in RN, I'll do it in RN. Uh, so the braid arrangement uh, is the following. Uh, let HIJ uh, be equal to the set of all X uh, such that xi is equal to xj. So the, you know, that, so there, you know, 1 less than or equal to i less than j less than or equal to n. So that, that's, that's a co-dimension 1 subspace. Uh, and, uh, um, and then I take all of them. I take all of those subspaces. So this is a collection of hyperplanes in Rn. Whatever else it is, it's a collection of hyperplanes in Rn. That, Okay, so now the job, you have to identify the chambers, so let's say what they are and the faces, and et cetera. So what are the chambers? Uh, what's C? Okay, so a chamber in the braid arrangement, you're not on any of the hyperplanes, right? It's the region of all space which is not on, so no coordinates are equal, okay? What that means is that in that chamber, the relative order of the points in that chamber is fixed. Yeah? Because not, nothing's equal. That means that you can associate to each chamber a permutation. So there are n factorial chambers. Right? So the 
chambers are the set of all points in Euclidean space with a given order, and there are n factorial, as n factorial chambers. What are the faces? Uh, so the faces, you're on certain hyperplanes, so certain coordinates are equal, and then you're on one side or the other of other hyperplanes. Um, uh, so what are the faces? Well, they're indexed by block-ordered partitions. So a block-ordered partition is something like this one, 3, 5, uh, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8. So it's a set partition of 1 up to n into blocks. And there's a, a first block, a second block, a third block, etc. OK, so it's a block. It's a set partition where the blocks are ordered. And what it means is that all of these coordinates are equal, all of these coordinates are equal, all of these coordinates are equal, all of those coordinates are equal. So within a block, that tells you which coordinates are equal. And all of the numbers, we're in a region of Euclidean space, all of these numbers are smaller than all of these numbers, are smaller than all of these numbers, are smaller than all of those numbers. So block order. Examples, real examples are coming, but that's it's not hard to see, it's, but then it makes sense and it's also true. That's what indexes the faces. Okay. Um, now I have to tell you about the projection operator, uh, and I'm going to tell you that by talking to you, but uh, uh, the projection operator is shuffling. So let me explain that. It's, it's quite easy to understand. Uh, it's uh, easy to write down, too, but let me, let me explain it to you. Um, so the chambers, I, I have a, a, an ordering of a deck of cards. That's my chamber. It's a permutation. I have a block-ordered partition. There it is, 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6, 7, and 8. I find cards 1, 3, 5. There's 1, 3, 5. Okay. I remove them, keeping them in their same relative order. And I put them over here. And then I take cards 2 or 4. I remove them, and I put them underneath. And then I take cards 6 and 7, whatever. And then I, so you remove the, block, the first block, keeping them in their same relative order, put them here. You remove the second block, keep them. That gets you a new permutation. That's the projection operator. So anybody can understand that. If you listen, if you're willing to listen, anybody can understand that. That uh, takes a little line of, of, OK, so what's an example of this random walk? Uh, well, we already saw that, but so let's do mm, some examples, actual examples. Um, so let me choose some face weights. Um, let WF be equal to 0 unless uh, uh, my face is equal to i and everything minus i. So a block with two parts, a question, a complaint. Yeah, I'm missing something on the block ordered partition. What's the difference between that block and the block with 1, 5, 3 instead of No, no, the blocks are unordered uh, within, in right. set, set. Right. No, so then you said about the shuffling, you keep them in their order. The order that they are in the permutation. So I've got a permutation. Maybe card 1 is above card 3 is above card 5. And then I would remove them. But if it happened to be that 5 was above 1 was above 3, I would remove them. And 5 is above 3 is above 5. So I keep, I remove them. Thank you for trying. And then I, I keep them in their same relative order. Is that? In the chamber point of view. Yes. Right. Right. That's, the, that's you know, the minimal number of changes, as it were. Okay. So I'm going to put weights now only on two block partitions, set partitions which have two blocks, a singleton and its complement. And then I'll make wi uh, if uh, f is equal to i and i complement. Okay. So what is this walk? It's the walk that Johan talked about, the Setlin Library. Um, I've got a, a deck of cards, or a collection of folders, or a collection of 
mag tapes, and I, I pick uh, a, a, an object at random. The propensity of picking object i is wi. I take it out and I put it on top. It's random to top. It's weighted random to top. That's, that's, that's what it is. Um, example. Uh, WF is, um, well, 1 over 2 to the n uh, if f is equal to s, uh, s complement, 0 otherwise. So my, my weights are going to be 0 unless my set partition has two blocks. And my uh, blocks, uh, two, two blocks, and it's a, blo it's a set and it's complement. And then I'm going to put the uniform, you know, the uniform distribution. So if you like, there are n positions, and I flip a fair coin for each of the n positions. Wherever the heads are, I, that's my S. So what's my <laughs> Markov chain? It's on shuffles, right? But it is shuffles now. Um, I have a deck of cards. I flip a fair coin for each card. I take those cards out and I put them on top. Okay, that's inverse riffle shuffling. Ordinary riffle shuffling, you cut a binomial number of cards off. And you go, Prrr. you don't go. Prrr. You drop them with probability of dropping a card proportional to packet size. That's the Gilbert Shannon Reads model. This is exactly the Gilbert Shannon Reads model. Not approximately not anything. That's what it is. Um, more examples are, are coming, um, and they, they will come, but let me hold off. Uh, but uh, um, there are many, many hyperplane arrangements. Uh, of course, there are many, many hyperplane arrangements. There are many famous ones. This is a, a big subject in mathematics, uh, in algebraic geometry, for example. Uh, um, topology, and um, every one of them <laughs> gives rise to many, many uh, Markov chains. So now I say, I hope you now don't think I'm completely crazy, because this, if you haven't heard it before, you think, hmm. but okay. Shuffling is a special case. So there's a complete theory. So what does that mean? Uh, well, I'll tell you two theorems, and this is work I did with Ken Brown. These chains, uh, just to give credit where credit is due, are, are due to Bidigar, Hanlon, and Rockmore, uh, and uh, also to Ken Brown and PD. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, well, maybe references coming, but it's easy to find the references. So what are some theorems? So first, the theorem should have hypothesis. Uh, so uh, a, any uh, hyperplane arrangement, arrangement, uh, uh, in Rn, uh, Wf, any face weights, okay, no hypotheses. Uh, um, then, uh, well, one thing is uh, uh, this Markov chain, Kcc prime, so it's a matrix. You know, it's a, it's a C by C matrix. Uh, these aren't reversible Markov chains. Taking a card out at random and putting it on top is different than taking the top card off. These aren't reversible. They really aren't reversible. They could be, but they're, they're, they're not. This matrix is diagonalizable. And that, the proof of that is hard a little bit. It's, it's, uh, it's top hard topology. But it's, this is diagonalizable, uh, is diagonalizable. with real non-negative eigenvalues. Um, the second thing is the following. We know all the eigenvalues. So not, you know. Uh, uh, 
So let um, S uh, be the intersection lattice. I'll explain. So I've got my finite collection of hyperplanes. Uh, S is the set of all possible finite intersections of them. And that's a partially ordered set under inclusion. So I can take the intersection of the first three hyperplanes, or two, four, and six. And those are all, those subsets, all possible subsets, uh, are, are uh, including the empty and the, and the intersection of all my hyperplanes. That's a, a post set under inclusion. Uh, for every S and S, uh, S contained in S, uh, there exists uh, an eigenvalue, lambda of S, uh, uh, and it's just equal to the sum of WF so that F um, is contained in uh, uh, S. So you add up the face weights overall. Uh, oh, is that is that right, or do I have it backwards? Because it is it is simple, and I may as well tell you the truth. Uh, there's no no reason to uh, no reason to lie. It doesn't look right, but uh, but. Uh, no, it's, it's that, that's all. So, so, you know, I have some line segment, I have a point. It might be that this, this, this point is contained in as a set in S. So it's just the sum over all of the, that's it. So, you know, that, that, that's it. And the multi, of course, the multiplicity, uh, three, uh, um, the multiplicity of, uh, of, uh, Of, uh, of, uh, of lambda sub s uh, is uh, the absolute value of the Mervius function, mu of s to uh, everything r to the d. Um, so I won't explain that, but probably people have seen that partially ordered sets have Mervius functions, right? Inclusion, exclusion, that kind of stuff. And so there's a Mervius function. I mean, I can define it. I don't think that'll help you if you haven't seen it. And, uh, um, but they're very computable Mervius functions, and, uh, and uh, that's the multiplicity of S. So, so I know all the eigenvalues, and, 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 and they're real eigenvalues, and that's what they are. So when you specialize, of course, these become interesting formulas, and I will specialize in a second, but um, th this is okay. In order, now, I, I have no hypotheses. Now, you know, the way this is a true theorem with no hypotheses, of course, I could be an idiot and just put m mass one on one of the faces. You know, I mean, so in order to make progress, maybe I better make some hypotheses, so, okay. So, uh, definition, uh, 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 cl c collection of face weights is separating, <coughs> separating, uh, if, uh, 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 for every um, H in A, for every <laughs> hyperplane, if not all of the face weights are contained in one of the hyperplanes, but let me write that out. If for every hyperplane there exists an F in, in, in F uh, such that uh, WF is positive and uh, F is not contained in H. So it just says, you know, not all of the face weights which you put mass on are contained in one hyperplane. Otherwise, you would restrict to that hyperplane and keep going. Okay, but so that's, that's separating. With that definition, here's theorem two. These are theorems of, of, from the paper with Ken Brown. Uh, uh, theorem two. Uh, um, what's theorem two? Uh, 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 part. <coughs> One uh, is uh, K uh, uh, has a unique stationary distribution if and only if uh, uh, WF is separating. Okay, that's the first part of the definition. Uh, let me give it a name, stationary distribution pi. 
Um, there's a description of pi of c, and we'll discuss in what sense this is a description, but um, it's the same description as Setlin found for the Setlin library, uh, except a little bit more subtle. Um, uh, an algorithm, so I'm going to describe a measure by giving you an algorithm to pick from it, continuation of my last talk. Uh, an algorithm uh, for choosing from pi, uh, is uh, sample f without replacement, I'll explain this, without replacement uh, from W sub f. Um, and uh, let C be equal to F1 times F2 times F, I don't know, I don't know, question mark. I mean, okay, let me explain that. Uh, um, so I've got my collection of face weights. Maybe they're, maybe they're one of those face weights. Put those face weights in an urn. Okay, they're different, there are some different face weights. Reach in and with probability proportional to the face weight, pull out a face. Okay, call that F1. Write it down. Leave it over there. Okay. Then reach in with probability proportional to the face weights relative to what's left. Pull out a face weight. Write it down. Keep, keep doing that until there's no face weights left. Okay, that's what I mean by sampling without replacement. And then, and then, from, it doesn't, because they're separating, it doesn't matter. Start at any chamber, project onto F1, then project onto F2, then project onto F3, et cetera. Keep going until you've projected onto all your face weights in that order. You're at some C. That's distributed according to the stationary distribution. Okay, so in this case, in this case, my face weights are, you know, W1 up to Wn. Um, what you do is, I'm going to generate a permutation, put W1 up to Wn in an urn, and pick out, okay, maybe I pick out W3, and so I write down 3, and then I pick out from what's left, you know, 7, I write down that. And so in this case, for example, the measure is, uh, uh, the, the measure, e.g., it would be W pi of sigma, the chance of getting the permutation sigma in that case, uh, is equal to W of sigma 1 uh, times uh, W of sigma 2 over 1 minus W of sigma 1, that is, you, you remove W of sigma 1 from the weight, times W of sigma 3 uh, divided by 1 minus W of sigma 1 minus W of sigma 2, etc. Is that okay? It's just sample without replacement. That, now this measure is a famous measure. It's called the loose model in, in perception psychology. It's just used in, in all kinds of areas of ec economics, ex et cetera. And so this is a simple method of sampling from the loose model. And there's a, there's a, a long discussion about that. So that's my second part of theorem two. And the third part of theorem two uh, is that the, the total variation distance uh, from any chamber C, uh, there are many, many versions of this, but here's one uh, to pi C, total variation is less than or equal to the sum uh, over one less than or equal to I less than J, uh, less than I don't know what, of uh, uh, less than K. Uh, uh, of uh, 1 minus uh, theta ij to the lth power, uh, where uh, theta ij is equal to the probability uh, you separate uh, uh, i and j in one step. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so, uh, um, um, uh, so um, what does that mean? Uh, uh, what does that mean? 
So I and J are hyperplanes. Uh, I and J are indexes of, of, of hyperplanes. And um, let's see. So there exists, this doesn't make sense either, sorry. Uh, but it's, it's, it's true, but I have to think what the interpretation is. Uh, um, Let's just see. It's separating. <laughs> so it, it probably I have, no, it's wrong. It's just wrong, that's all. That's, that's a good reason it doesn't make sense. It's wrong. <laughs> okay. it's, it's almost right. It's, it's, but, OK, it's the sum over uh, h uh, of uh, 1 uh, minus uh, uh, 1 minus uh, theta sub uh, h uh, to the L, OK, where theta sub uh, h is the probability that uh, you pick a face, uh, you, uh, the probability you pick a face, uh, not containing h, not contained in H, right? So it's, it's the numbers that are guaranteed by my hypotheses. And uh, there are other versions of this bound. But um, uh, uh, so there are many other things, there are many other parts of this theorem. But um, let me take us through some examples uh, so you can look and see what it says. Um, so let me treat those examples. Um, so, for example, for the Setlin library, uh, example, uh, uh, um, uh, with weights wi. So that's you know random to random to uh, top uh, with where you pick random. Uh, with probability um, wi. Um, so there, um, uh, let's see, the hyperplanes are hij, right? hij is where the ith coordinate is equal to the jth coordinate. And what's the chance that I pick a face not having the ith coordinate equal to the jth coordinate? Well, pick anything that doesn't involve i and j, 1 minus wi minus wj. The bound gives uh, this uh, bound, uh, kl minus pi, this loose model, uh, is less than or equal to the sum uh, over now all hyperplanes, so 1 less than or equal to i, less than j, less than or equal to n, say, of 1 minus theta i minus theta j to the L. And there, as I said, there are refinements of these bounds, but let's just try this out so you can look at it, uh, e.g., uh, if theta i is equal to 1 over n, for example, uh, um, then uh, this is, uh, this is uh, n choose 2 times uh, 1 minus 2 over n to the L. This, that's each of these is 1 over n. And so how large does L have to be? Well, this is less than or equal to uh, e to the log n squared, 2 log n over 2 uh, uh, minus uh, 2L over n. This is less than or equal to that. And so if L, uh, and that's less than or equal to e to the minus uh, 2C, uh, over 2 uh, if uh, L is equal to uh, n log n plus c. So that's uh, the bound that we, that we, we talked about earlier. Uh, and, and but it, you know, it, but this has nothing to do with that choice of face weights in a paper that I wrote 20 years ago in the proceedings of the National Academy. I took very general collections of face weights and I used this bound 
things like take theta i to be take theta i to be one over i to the s, where s is uh, a power, or take theta i to be one over two to the i. Uh, I took very general face weights, and you can see what this bound gives. And I also gave matching lower bounds and uh, and showed that there are phase transitions. I got the sharp cutoff using these arguments for you know lots of natural choices of face weights. So. You know, it's, that, that's, a, that's a case. Um, let's do shuffling, uh, just to show it's not perfect. Uh, example, um, uh, shuffling, riffle shuffling. Um, and so there, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, anyway, the, there the bound becomes, uh, it's the same bound, uh, the, the KL minus pi, well, it's a little bit different. It's less than or equal to n choose 2 times 1 half to the L. That's, that's what the second eigenvalue is. And, uh, and so this says that uh, eg uh, if L is equal to, uh, if L is equal to twice log to the base 2 of n plus c, this is less than or equal to e to the minus c over 2, if L is equal to twice. Um, and you know that's not a bad answer, uh, but it's not the right answer. The right answer is uh, three halves log to the base two of n. And well, that's a paper I wrote with Dave Fire and etc. Uh, but um, uh, it doesn't give bad answers. Um, if one wanted to make a little entree into this area. Um, I didn't pay much attention to getting lower bounds, um, and uh, one could try. Uh, I, I didn't say it, but we we also know all the eigenvectors. Uh, I didn't I didn't say that, but we it should be four. <laughs> we also know all the eigenvectors in some sense of no, but I mean in a reasonable sense of no. Certainly, the eigenvectors corresponding to the to the top eigenvalues have reasonable descriptions. And so one can try to use uh, the kinds of bounds that Johann was talking about or just think and, uh, uh, and, uh, and try to get lower bounds. I'm sure that that's doable, useful work, and, and it would be interesting to understand when these bounds are sharp and when they're not. Um, they're, they're almost always sharp up to constants, but if you want to prove cutoff and things like that, you have to do better. Um, okay, so now I hope you see what I mean um, when I said um, this is a class of Markov chains for which we, you know, not we know everything, but we more or less know everything, where there's a very complete theory. And let me give one indication uh, of the proof, because just it's a nice argument, and actually, OK, uh, I want to prove this, um, but I, 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 you need to know a little more geometry than it's reasonable to expect you to know. Uh, and there's not time to do it, so let me do it in the simplest, in a simple case. Um, uh, so a line of proof, I'll just say a line of proof. Um, so work in, on SN. Um, uh, um, for the braid arrangement, um, let uh, w of f uh, uh, be equal to anything, anything separating, uh, separating, uh, uh, if um, uh, f is equal to s uh, uh, and s complement and zero otherwise. So um, this is a Markov chain um, which has its own literature uh, in the computer science literature, um, but in which you have a, a bunch of cards and you pick a set, an arbitrary set, with probability w of s. I'll call it w of s. Uh, OK, and then you take the, you know, you take the cards in s you know, you pick 1, 3, 17, you remove those, keeping their, them in their same relative order, and put them on top. That's it. You know, just, that's a, just take some cards out and put them to the top. But okay. there are many, many other chains you could take, but this is a class of chains. So um, 
one way of proving this bound is by coupling, and I'll just do the coupling, and I think it's clear enough that everybody will follow it. So whatever the stationary distribution is, and to be honest, God knows what it is in this case. I mean, it's, it's probably not so easy to describe. There's some stationary distribution. The weights are separating. There's a unique stationary distribution. Pick one deck. Arrange it according to its stationary distribution. Pick it from its stationary distribution. I have a first deck, which is in order 1 up to n. Okay. I'm just going to make the same moves in both decks, just like Pietro was doing. So I pick a set, 1, 3, 5. I move it to the top. I pick 1, 3, 5. Who knows what order they're in here? And I move it to the top. Okay. Then I pick you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. I move it to the top, move it to the top. I just keep doing that. Okay. That's, that, that's my. Now look at, consider, let t be the first time every pair of cards has been separated at least once. OK, that, th since the weights will separate individual cards, that's my assumption. If I keep going, every pair of cards will have been separated, and then that'll, that'll happen. OK, some, sometime that'll happen. Stop time. It's T, stop time. Uh, um, I claim the two decks are in the same order at that time. Why? OK, why, why, why? Why is it true? OK, pick two cards, I and J. You know, there they are, fix I and J. There's a last time that they were separated. As I've been separating them along, there's a last time they were separated. At that time, uh, whatever happened, either I is above J in both decks, because I did the same thing. They were separated. Either I is above J in those, both decks, or J is above I in both decks. Okay. After that time, they were both either in the same packet that was removed or in the packet that was left behind. So at the end, they're in the same relative order. So every pair of cards is in the same relative order. And then you can check. It's, it's trivial, but you just think for yourself. If you have two decks of cards and every pair of cards is in the same relative order, the two decks are in the same relative order. So that's an aha argument, right? It's just clear. It's just OK. What's the mixing time? Uh, well, you know, you can just use a union bound. You can do more sophisticated things, but from that uh, you get uh, by the coupling bound uh, uh, that uh, KL from any start doesn't matter from where you started minus pi uh, is less than or equal to uh, the thing I wrote down before one less than or equal to i less than j less than or equal to n of one minus theta i j to the l that where theta i j to the theta i j is equal to the chance that you separate i and j in one step. And of course, you have to figure that out for your individual weights. So um, the general argument is just a geometric version of this argument, uh, but you need to think about the geometry of hyperplane arrangements, and I don't want to. I don't want to do that. Tell me what time it is, so that I. What time is it? Five more minutes. Good. Um, okay. So uh, this subject. Um, goes on, and I had a bunch of other examples to tell you about. Uh, I'll just tell you this because it's such a cute example, and then it le shows you some research problems. Um, uh, here's an example um, uh, of a Markov chain which falls into this uh, bailiwick. Um, take a graph. Um, uh, let script G be a graph. with n vertices. And um, uh, colored red and blue. OK. OK. 
Okay? That's my state space of the process, just two colorings of, of the vertices of a, of a graph. And the Markov chain is um, uh, pick an edge. You could say with weights, but let's say at random. And um, uh, color the two vertices. Uh, red, red, or blue, blue. Just change the colors with probability of half. Okay, so that's a kind of physicy sounding chain. You know, two things go off. You could do it in continuous time and have it hopping around, but you pick an edge at random and either they're both Republicans or they're both Democrats or however you want to think about it. That's a Markov chain on two colorings of a graph. Kind of natural, simple Markov chain. And that exactly falls into this bailiwick, uh, and uh, it comes from the Boolean arrangement uh, from uh, uh, um, script A is equal to the set of all HI, where HI are just the usual hyperplanes, uh, the set of all X in Rn such that Xi is zero. The, the usual coordinate hyperplanes. And if you think about, so it's reasonable, easy homework problem, or ask me on the bus or something like that, if you think about um, what the Boolean arrangement is, what are the chambers of the Boolean arrangement? Well, we know what the chambers are, the, the orthants, right? There's two to the n chambers. What are the faces? Well, there are three to the n faces. And uh, think about that. And this is exactly one of these Markov chains. And we know everything except it's an interesting question. So the stationary distribution is a measure on two colorings of the vertices of a graph. What is it? How can we describe it? How can we understand it? Let me take the simplest example, uh, and I know it's, let me take the graph to be a path. So the, the thing is, I'm picking an edge at random, and I'm coloring them both blue. And then I'm picking an edge at random, and I'm coloring them both red, et cetera. I do that till it's stationary, or there is a stationary distribution. What is it like? Well, it's nothing like uniform. For example, if I have the, the coloring which is all red, half the time you stay there, right? And if it's all blue, half the time you stay there. Whereas if it's you know, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, then you change, you go away from there. So it's quite non-uniform. Try to understand, describe that measure. Uh, they're interesting math problems there. It's interesting already on the complete graph trying to understand the stationary distribution of the measure on the complete graph. In particular, the, the measure which is alternating red, blue, red, blue, red, blue has stationary probability const, constant over n factorial, and, uh, and uh, all reds, uh, red, 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 is some other constant over 2 to the n. So the, you know, but this is a random field we've just described, and um, it's two dependent. It's got a meaning and probability, but if you have two vertices and they have no edge in common, they're independent in this, in this field. These are, this is an interesting process, and trying to understand it is interesting, but we know all the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors, we know rates of convergence, we, we know a lot about it. Color. Yeah. You, you could start that way, for example. Right, but isn't that a trend? Yes, it is. It is. So, so if you have something with, with, with lots and lots of alternations, then it's very rare. That is, if you could have, you could have something, you, you, you can get something with lots of alternations. Take the thing with the most alternations that has positive mass. That, that state, no, that state has limiting probability zero, right? That's true, that's true. Thank you for following, that's true, right? Th this, is, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this result is, a, is quite an interesting paper uh, uh, by Ron Graham and Fan Chung, is, uh, is saying something about the stationary distribution of this on a path. Uh, it's, it's quite hard generating functions and some, actually some algebraic geometry uh, it's a, quite an interesting paper. Uh, okay, what I tried to tell you about, that was method eight, the method of miracles. 
you know, every once in a while a miracle happens. For me, this part of the world I regard as a miracle, a big class of chains for which you can say everything. I've written quite a number of papers about this, and there are other people who have written papers. Uh, in particular, Ken Brown went on and he generalized this to um, uh, random walks on idempotent semigroups. Uh, more or less the whole theory goes through. You can do random walks on the chambers of a building. Uh, everything seems to go through. And there is starting to be uh, a, a, a bit of literature, but there's still a million, a million things to do. So I, I hope I, I gave you a flavor of what this part is like. If people want to vote on which of these topics I do my, ne my next lec lecture, I'll listen. I'm probably going to talk about seven, but if you want to try to influence me, I'll be happy to be influenced. It's time to stop. Thank you.